Hello, and thanks for joining me for Horror Origins, Episode 7, The Horrifying Mummy, where we're going to be taking a look at Arthur Conan Doyle's short story titled Lot Number 249. Now, you may want to stop me right there and ask, but Matt, isn't there a Poe story called Some Words with a Mummy in 1845 that predates this one? Or how about, or how about Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century by Jane Luden? Well, yes, my astute and fictitious objector, but this episode is called The Horrifying Mummy, and horrifying really is the key word here. Those other stories that have mummies and Egyptian themes that predate this one do, but not in a horror context. And certainly, lot number 249 was the first story that put the deadly and mysterious figure shrouded in burial wrappings into the canon of other classic monsters. So, let's bust out our archaeological tools and unearth this first in literary horror. Okay, so let's first take a look at the author. Now, the author to Lot 249 is Sir Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle. He was a British author, perhaps best known for his incredibly popular series featuring Detective Sherlock Holmes. Doyle was a prolific writer, and his body of work included all sorts of genres and mediums. He was born in 1859 in Scotland to an Irish Catholic woman and a drunkard of a father. He lived in pretty poor conditions until eventually his father died and his care was taken up by his uncles, who were much more well-off. He was then sent to prep school and then on to Stonyhurst College until 1875, where he got his doctorate in medicine. Now, there's a tremendous wealth of information out there concerning this beloved author, And so rather than do an overview of his life, I'll just add a couple of little facts here I learned while doing my research that I didn't beforehand know and you might find interesting as well. Firstly, uh, is that Conan Doyle was a fervent advocate of justice, and he personally investigated two closed cases which led to two men being exonerated of the crimes they were accused of. The first was a man named George Adalji, a half-Indian lawyer that was accused of sending threatening letters and mutilating animals even though the mutilations continued after his arrest. The second concerned a man named Oscar Slater, a proprietor of a gambling den, and he was accused of bludgeoning an 82-year-old woman. Doyle noted several inconsistencies in the prosecution, and he had a general sense that in the second case Slater was not guilty. And he, he got them off. I mean, he, he, he did do what he set out to do. Now, what's remarkable is not just that he played a role in real life for these men that his characters had in his stories, but that his work in these two instances helped to create the Court of Criminal Appeals that was established in 1907. Crazy, right? Now, the second fact I learned about Conan Doyle is that Arthur Conan Doyle, good old Art Doyle, uh, his name, Conan Doyle, was a compound surname that he created himself. Uh, His name is just Doyle. And he did that just because he thought it sounded cooler. All right. So let's take a look at the context of the story. Now, this story was published in 1892. And this is the same year that the Scottish universities um, published an ordinance authorizing universities to provide the education and graduation for women. During this time, England continue, was continuing its conquest into the Nigerian interior. Uh, off official opening of the London Paris telephone system happened just the year before, and Conan Doyle's popularity was just exploding to new heights with his detective stories featuring Sherlock Holmes, and it was finally being widely circulated in the Strand magazine for the first time. The public were absolutely hungry for anything that Conan Doyle could produce, and so with a lot number 249, he included other big cultural fascinations at the time, uh, the chief among them being Egyptomania. Man, people were just gaga over the discoveries of ancient Egypt at this time, and, and still are to this day. Beginning right at the outset of the 19th century with Napoleon's Egyptian campaign, people were just thrilled with the stories and discoveries of the tombs and monuments found in what must have felt like a far-off and magical land. Now, this story predates the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb by about 30 years, but even still, anything that would have been labeled Egypt caught people's attention. Okay, so let's take a look at the story. This story has some absolutely beautiful writing in it. So I've 
snipped some out, and I'm going to include it here and read it to you just to give you a flavor of what the story has in it and, uh, and hopefully get you more interested in the story. Conan Doyle is a master at this stuff. Okay, so right at the outset, we have a great opening paragraph, which I'll read to you now. Of the dealings of Edward Billingham with William Monkhouse Lee and of the cause of the great terror of Amber Crombie Smith, it may be that no absolute and final judgment will ever be delivered. It is true that we have the full and clear narrative of Smith himself, and such corroboration as he could look for from Thomas Stiles, the servant, from the Reverend Plumptree Peterson, fellow of Olds, and from other such peoples as chance to gain some passing glance at this or that incident in a singular chain of events. Yet, in the main, the story must rest upon Smith alone, and the most will think that it is more likely that one brain, however outwardly sane, has some subtle warp in its texture, some strange flaw in its workings, than that the path of nature has been overstepped in open day in so famed a center of learning and light as the University of Oxford. Yet, when we think how narrow and how devious this path of nature is, how dimly we can trace it for all our lamps of science, and how from the darkness which girds it round great and terrible possibilities loom ever shadowly upwards, it is a bold and confident man who will put a limit to the strange by-paths into which the human spirit may wander. Okay, so let's dive into the plot of the story. The story follows a protagonist named Amber Crombie Smith, a medical student living on campus at Oxford. One day, our Mr. Smith is called by a fellow boarder and student named William Monkhouse Lee. Great name. <laughs> there, there's so many great names in this story. Now, he's called into the room of a fellow student and neighbor, um, a man named Edward Bellingham, after a shriek is heard late one evening. Monkhouse Lee, uh, it turns out, is a good friend with Bellingham, and his sister is even arranged to marry him. Bellingham, we find, is obsessed with Egyptian lore and is an avid amateur Egyptologist and his whole set of rooms is filled with ancient Egyptian artifacts. He is found, supine on the floor, seeming to have suffered some sort of severe shock and fainted. Nearby to him, a huge six-foot-seven-inch mummy is seen lying on the nearby table, as if it were being examined. Now, I'm thinking, mummies shrink when you, when they go, you know, the process of mummification and the ages get, you know, racked up. I mean, bodies just kind of shrink. So for the mummy to be six foot seven inches, I mean, that's a gigantic mummy. Now, while our protagonist is reviving his neighbor, we learn from Monkhouse Lee, who's a close friend of Bellingham's and the one that discovered the body or discovered that his friend fainted on the floor, just how passionate Bellingham is in his studies and how passionate he is about that particular mummy. Bellingham is eventually revived, and he blames his state on the mummy, and suspiciously he seems relieved that the other students that came running to his aid don't po possess the ability to read hieroglyphics. For the next few weeks, Smith continues to spend time with Bellingham, and learns of his brilliance and eccentricities. There are some hilarious near misses uh, with the mummy, moving around downstairs, reports of Bellingham talking to himself, a lame excuse that he has a dog that nobody has ever seen before, and the general assumption by Smith is that he might be keeping a girl in his room, something that could ruin his academic career if it were found out. Then we learn that someone named Norton is attacked by a presumed gorilla. What? Like, out of the blue, they assume it's a gorilla. And this Norton character... You know, after he comes to and recovers a little bit, uh, we find out he never saw the attacker. He felt something drop down out of a tree onto him and then vault over a nearby wall before help could arrive, could arrive to see it. And what's more, we learn here that Bellingham has had a long standing grudge with Norton. The story takes a beat, resuming when an argument is heard by Smith between Bellingham and Monkhouse Lee. And we learn that Monkhouse Lee has denied his sister to Bellingham, saying that he would rather see her dead than wedded to his former friend. Smith stealthily retreats and meets up with Monkhouse Lee later as he's hanging out by the river by the university. Monkhouse Lee refuses to talk to him about the argument he's had with Bellingham, 
but recommends that Smith no longer spend any time with the strange Egyptologist. Enter here uh, another character with a great name, Dr. Plumptree Peterson. He's an old friend of our main character, Smith, and someone that we learn he regularly spends time with. Plumptree uh, lives way, a ways out from anything and generally supports Smith like a father figure. Smith wants to discuss the strange happenings going on, but holds his tongue. He doesn't want to disgrace anyone or make anyone seem strange. Some time then passes, and Smith goes to return a book to Bellingham late one evening, doing his best to distance himself from the, the man that seems to be acting stranger and stranger, and upon the recommendation by Monkhouse Lee that he should back off. When he goes to return the book, when just outside, uh, he, lear he hears, hears a commotion outside and learns that Monkhouse Lee has almost been drowned. There's a crowd forming around the riverbank, and they call for Smith to run up to his room for some brandy. Our protagonist does so, and in so doing, notices that the mummy that had been missing from its coffin just moments before when he returned the book is now safely tucked back inside its coffin. Glints in the shriveled black eyes that seem to gleam out at him menacingly. Monkhouse Lee is brought back from death with some work and some brandy, and he reports that he was thrown into the water by something incredibly strong. And with that, finally, Smith puts the pieces together and suspects that Bellingham and the mummy are responsible for what's going on. Upon returning to his room, Bellingham confronts Smith, wanting to hear what happened with Monkhouse Lee. So Bellingham sort of comes out and, and asks him, you know, Oh, I heard Monkhouse Lee was heard. I heard something happen. Tell me all about it. You know, with laughter behind his eyes. Smith threatens him, telling him that he sus what he suspects and that if another person gets hurt, that he's going to pay. Shortly thereafter, uh, the next next night, on the little, little traveled road out to Plumptree's house, Smith starts heading out that way by himself, and the following happens, which is another little bit from the story I'm going to read to you now. It was a lonely and little frequented road which led to his friend's house. Early as it was, Smith did not meet a single soul upon his way. He walked briskly along until he came to the avenue gate, which opened onto the long gravel drive leading up to Farlingford. In front of him, he could see the cozy red light of the windows glimmering through the foliage. He stood with his hand upon the iron latch of the swinging gate, and he glanced back at the road along which he had come. Something was coming swiftly down it. It moved in the shadow of the hedge, silently and furtively, a dark, crouching figure dimly visible against the black background. Even as he gazed back at it, it had lessened its distance by twenty paces and was fast closing upon him. Out of the darkness he had a glimpse of a scraggy neck and of two eyes that will ever haunt him in his dreams. He turned, and with a cry of terror he ran for his life up the avenue. There were the red lights, the signals of safety, almost within a stone's throw of him. He was a famous runner, but never had he run as he ran that night. The heavy gate had a swung into place behind him, but he heard it crash open again before his pursuer. As he rushed madly and wildly through the night, he could hear a swift, dry patter behind him, and he could see, as he threw back a glance, that his horror was bounding like a tiger at his heels. With blazing eyes and with one stringy arm thrown out, thank God the door was ajar. He could see with the thin bar of light that had shot from the lamp in the hall. Nearer yet sounded the clatter from behind. He heard a horse gurgling at his very shoulder, and with a shriek he flung himself against the door, slamming and bolting it behind him, and sank, half fainting, into the hall chair. So there you have it. A huge, fast mummy. Not the stumbling, slow, zombie-like figure we have seen so many times in so many incarnations since. Now, Smith then confesses what he thinks is happening to his friend Plumptree Peterson, and they both can sort of even see the mummy lurking around the perimeter of the house, waiting for him to come back outside. But, of course, it can't be seen well enough for Plumptree to really believe the incredible stories. He thinks maybe it's just a stalker. Smith then puts his account down, and it, that becomes the document that we, as the reader, are presumably reading. He spends the night at Plumptree's, and then the following day, he goes out and gears up for his final confrontation with Bellingham. 
<clears throat> he goes and he grabs a hunting crop, the largest dissection knife he can get, and a pistol. He goes back to his building and corners Bellingham in his room. Smith forces him at gunpoint to cut up the mummy. Bellingham first protests, but then relents and hacks up the mummy and throws the parts into the fire. Smith then remembers the scroll that he was uh, Bellingham was relieved that no one could read when he first found him fainted on the floor. Bellingham pleads with Smith, but is told in no uncertain terms that if he continues his work here, Smith will put a bullet between his eyes, and the scroll is burned. The story concludes with a small wrap-up. Smith then goes on with his life, presumably graduating, and Bellingham is last heard of living out his life in the Sudan. And the only account of the strange events that took place is the log that we as the reader are reading. Now, the legacy of this story uh, really is in the Egyptomian, Egyptomania, that still continues to this very day. And, you know, this story from an incredibly popular author did, of course, do its part to keep that train a-rolling. But more so than that, this story was the first to make that fascination, that, that fascinating artifact of the mummy, and turn it, those preserved remains, themselves, into the being of terror and mystery. And it's the reason that I love this story. Hey, if you enjoy this podcast and learning about the strange works of fiction that have brought us to where we are today, I implore you to take a moment and write a review for the show. It'll help more people find out about it, and the more people we can get interested in this stuff, the better. And if you appreciate podcasts that are advertisement-free and want to say thanks, or make a recommendation for the show, feel free to email me at author at matthewtansic.com or click on the contact button on matthewtansic.com. And lastly, if you want to stay up to speed on this or any other of my creative projects, I am on Twitter. I tweet at tans444, that's T-A-N-Z-444. Feel free to reach out. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, thanks for joining me.